Hi, thanks for joining us for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. I'm Chris Cooper. Pollinators are an important part of the garden. Today we're going to talk about bees. Also, you can bring the garden inside with houseplants, but what are the best kinds and how do you take care of them? That's just ahead on the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Production funding for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South is provided by Goodwin's Landscape and Garden Center in Germantown since 1943 and continuing to offer its plants for successful gardening with seven greenhouses and three acres of plants plus comprehensive landscape services. International Paper Foundation. The WKNO Production Fund. The WKNO Endowment Fund. And by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to The Family Plot. I'm Chris Cooper. Joining me today is Lori Williams. Lori is the Adult Education Manager at the Memphis Botanic Garden. And David Glover is here. Hi. David is the Bartlett Bee Whisperer. Thanks for joining us today. It's good to be here. All right, Ms. Lori, let's talk houseplants. And as you can see on this table, we have some beautiful plants here. Well, and today I brought some things that may not be beautiful as much as they are interesting. Yes, okay? interesting. Um, yes. At the Botanic Garden, sometimes we'll get plants that have been um, smuggled into the country or the taxes haven't been paid or they haven't been in, uh, inspected, those okay. kind of things. And so rather than just trash them, they'll, they'll offer them to us. Hmm. And so we got um, some of these we'll never be able to sell, we'll never be able to give away or anything else. And so we have to kind of keep, keep, uh, keep the lid on them. Okay. But this one is one that was um, that way. And isn't it kind of an unusual plant? It is. These are its flowers at the top. And if they can zoom in, it looks like it's quilted. It. I mean, okay. it, it looks like it, and it will never do much else other than that. <laughs> It'll <laughs> so get a little it. bigger, uh, about the size of a baseball. Um, but so that one's kind of cool. This one is actually carnivorous. That's a butterwort. And um, the surface of the leaf gets sticky, and gnats and sm real small insects will stick to that, and then it digests the protein, oh and that's how God. it feeds itself. Perfect. Uh, kind for, of a swamp plant. Yeah, perfect for fungus gnats. <laughs> fungus gnats, yes. If you get fungus gnats in your yes, house plants, yes. um, that one will, you know, I put a glass of red wine out on the counter, and that'll attract them too, but you uh -huh. know, after a while it gets kind of funky, it gets kind of moldy. <laughs> remember to dump it that will take care yes. of that problem it doesn't look real good when it's all covered with gnats but <laughs> it's better than having them in your face a um, couple of these are your euphorbias this one has um, probably gotten a virus sometime in it way mm -hmm. back and then it'll make that that the uh, chlorophyll kind of disappear okay. and then they start propagating them because that's how we get a lot of variegation in a lot of our plants is through a virus that's invaded the plant um, but that one's kind of cool mm -hmm. And this one, um, only a mother could love. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's just really not a very attractive plant. Uh, one of the things I brought it for was to show what spider mites look like. And I think your cameras were going to get a good shot, but there's a real fine little web on the mm -hmm. underside of leaves a lot of times, or you'll notice where the leaf connects to the stem, you'll see sort of a real fine web. Not a spider's web, but it's just kind of webbing. Mm -hmm. And they're so small, it's hard to see them with the naked eye. But you can put a piece of white paper under right. and kind of flick the, the leaf, and the, the spider mites will fall on it. Right. And you can tell because when you mash them, dirt doesn't, streak the spider mites will yes um, okay. so that one's one kind of and then this one um, like this one, one looks though. like um, old man's fingers uh -huh. or something it's it it's it's dis, it's disguised that way so uh, animals that would eat it don't know it looks like twigs they're right. not going to chew on a dry twig and it looks like a dry twig it does. And so that's its defense a bit get a, against getting eaten. Like that. Yeah, it looks like little, so. yeah, little mm -hmm. fingers. Yeah, kind of kind of interesting. Again, not necessarily beautiful, but kind of kind of funky, right. yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, this is a desert rose or a denium obesum. Uh, beautiful plant. Uh, they, I've heard in Indonesia they grow these as hedges. They actually take wow. hedge clippers to them, which is kind of interesting. But obesum because it comes out of the ground as fat at the, at, real fat at the base. Okay. So, and you can collect the seeds and grow these. Uh, I just put a bunch of them in a, in a sandy soil and I think all of them germinated and they came up out of the ground looking exactly like this. So a little fat stem coming out of the okay. ground and a couple of little leaves at the top. Um, this one has scale on it, so I wanted to bring it and show okay. the scale and sure. the mealybug as well. And right here we have our mealybug right. right there. And up here we have our scale um, right there. And th those are both in the same family, and they're really destructive because mm -hmm. they'll get in and suck the juices of the plant, and before you know it, you've got all this sticky stuff, powdery mildew sticks to it, mm -hmm. and then your, your plant starts to decline. So they're yeah. real important when you have house plants to check them regularly. When you're watering them, kind of turn the leaves over and look that's at right. what's going on. I do that every week. And something else that's important to do is make sure you turn them. 
because okay. they're going to be growing towards the light. So if sure. you've got them in front of a window, um, you'll notice when you turn it, all of a sudden everything's hanging out into the room instead of growing towards the light. And so it'll keep it from getting so lopsided. And I try to turn them every week when I water them as well. Okay. Always examine your plants. That's what always, I tell folks. Whether always. inside or outside. Absolutely. That's right. Yep. Um, and if you keep them inside, there's no natural predators to take care of some of the, the yes. problems. You know, ladybugs will eat the aphids and stuff if right. they're outdoors. Right. Indoors, most of us don't have ladybugs flying around. But something else that's kind of nice to do is if you've got a bunch of small plants and little bitty pots, okay, um, you have to take care of each one of them individually. And they don't, I mean, they're, they're still pretty plants. Mm -hmm. But think about putting them together in a combination pot. Um, see how each of these looks individually, okay. okay? But if you go ahead and put them together in a pot, you've got one that's kind of going to get tall, one that's going to spill over the edge. So you've got the, what is it, the thriller, the, the spiller, spiller, and the filler yeah, like they do right. in container <laughs> gardens. Um, right. Or roundy, let's see, moundy, spiky, and floppy. Okay. I think, uh, um, you got it. The garden writer says yeah. it, yeah. But this one up here in front, if they can pan to that, that one was done that uh, probably two years ago. Had a bunch of little itty bitty plants I was taking care of, and I just got sort of tired of it. So I stuck them all in one big pot. Okay. And it makes a really nice plant because you've got a variety of textures, a variety of colors, and and it's really nice to have things that grow up and over the edge mm -hmm. and sort of fill in in the middle. Now let me ask you this, are those plants easy to take care of though? Well, you've also got to make sure that you put plants that want the same conditions mm -hmm. in a pot. You can't put a desert plant in with like a philodendron okay. because Good. they're going to need different light um, requirements and also different water requirements. Okay. And Good. so, but they are, they're easy to take care of if you match the plants for the, for the kind, okay. you know, the kind of Care. Another question, what's a good starter plant for somebody that wants a house plant? What do you think? Um, probably spider plants. Hmm. They're forgiving if you forget to water them. They don't <laughs> die right away. Yeah. Um, or spathophyllum is the thing, yes. same way. Yes. They'll wilt and they'll, they'll give you several days to get up off the sofa and water your plants. Uh -huh. I call them an indicator plant. <laughs> Indicators, uh, it's yeah. time to water yeah. your plants. That's right. um, there are some that, you know, they get a little dry and they're gone. Yeah. It, you know, you got one chance <laughs> if you don't take care of okay. their history. Uh, this one up here in front is called a pencil cactus, mm -hmm. and a lot of people have grown that. It's also a euphorbia. The euphorbias you need to be a little careful with because they have a milky sap in them. Right. That's why that's what makes them euphorbias, and it can cause dermatitis on some people. And when I was working at the zoo, I was doing cuttings, and so you lay them all out and let them callus over, and I must have gotten some. I was wearing rubber gloves and long sleeves, but I must have gotten some on my shirt sleeve. Uh -huh. Did this, oh, and my nose blistered. Yeah, I was going to say, it irritates your skin. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, so that, that's kind of, if you have cats that chew on plants, you might not want to oh, do wow. the euphorbia, so you have to be kind of careful with that, too. Okay. Now, while we have a little time left, definitely want to cover this, mm -hmm. um, because, you know, the Olympics are coming up mm -hmm. in Rio, and there's the whole thing about the Zika virus. Mm -hmm. But if you have plants, are there any concerns about mosquitoes that may carry the Zika virus? Really important to make sure you don't have standing water in the saucers. Okay. Very important. And you shouldn't anyway, but because that's where mosquitoes breed is yeah. in standing water. And it doesn't take much, like an eighth of a teaspoon, I think they can breed in. Yes. And so it's very important to water, um, dump the saucers. And also if you have bromeliads, you know, you're supposed to water them in that little center cup. Mm -hmm. Sometimes mm -hmm. you'll see a frog peeking out of there. Mm -hmm. um, you shouldn't have standing water in bromeliads either because, well, again, you can, yeah. yeah. And uh, it's, it's going to be kind of scary in the next couple of years. Um, Wow. With Zika around, so. Yeah. Spreading pretty, yeah, pretty rapidly, so mm -hmm. we're here. Mm -hmm. All yeah. right, yeah. so last thing, what about taking care of the house plants, though? I mean, okay. we talked about watering, what about light requirements, okay. humidity? You One know, of the strange else. things about house plants in your house in the summer is the light may be lower. Mm, and okay. the reason for that is because your trees have leafed out. And so all of a sudden, right. there's not sun coming into your house like there is. If you've planted your trees correctly and you're helping right. with your air conditioning sure. <laughs> bills, um, that's how you want it. So you may need to move them to a different room that doesn't have as much tree okay. cover in the okay. front. Because um, they're still going to need a lot of light, and actually more light probably because this is their growing season okay. for most of them. Okay. Yeah. And make sure we don't put them under the vents. Right, right, right under the vents. And, and you don't want them in a west window either, probably, south yeah. or west window, if you don't have trees because they'll get too much. They get sunburned real easily in the house. Okay. Laura, well, we appreciate that good information Thank and these you. interesting plants. Thank you much. There are a number of gardening events going on in the next couple of weeks. Here are just a few that might interest you. Hi, Mr. David. You're here to talk about bees. So okay. how are the bees doing? Well, we just received the annual report from the USDA NAS report and from Bee Informed Partnership. From April of last year to April of this year, we've lost 44% of them. Wow. That's a huge number. That's a big number. And, and, I, and I say that every, every time we look at the losses, we, we see that they're big and we haven't lost all of our bees yet. And the reason we haven't lost them yet is because every spring, the beekeepers double what they have left. Okay. So 
my fear is when we get to the 50% rate, we won't be able to double again. And do, you, there, do you think we're going to get to the 50%? I hope not. But the oh good thing is uh, calling collapse disorder is not calling collapse disorder. Okay. We've been able to find down to a specific situation, and that's the Varroa mite. We've talked about it over mm -hmm. the last couple of years. Right. Varroa is like a bee tick. It gets on the bee and it sucks the hemolith, the bee blood, out of its body. But it vectors about 20 different diseases. Wow. And so we're able to tie the diseases to the loss of the bees. And for the migratory beekeepers, this is a bad thing. Half of our bees go to California every year for the almond fields. Mm -hmm. And if there's anybody there that has varroa, it spreads. It's like kids in, in school. They go first summer, first week, they're back in school, and little Tommy Snot knows, touches everybody and loves on everybody, and they get sick. Right. So, the USDA, Bee Informed Partnership, the NASH report are all pointing at Varroa as the number one killer of our bees. Varroa mites. Hmm. And we now have a number two. Oh, wow. Okay. Starvation. Sounds familiar. Yes. Something that we've talked about. Yes. We need plants that are bee food. And we have a lot of ornamental plants that don't provide mm -hmm. food for the bees. We have a lot of grain yards. My neighbors love me. My front yard looks okay. My backyard looks horrible. I've got the clover. I've got the dandelions. But I've got bees, right, and the bees right. have food. So we need to pay attention to what we plant so that it is bee-friendly. Okay. So those are the things that we're looking at. And oddly enough, pesticides didn't make the top two. Everybody worries about pesticides. Yes, yeah, specifically the neonicotinoids. And, um, and yes, we've found that the bees can get drunk off of that, okay. and they may not make it home, but it's starvation and it's the mites. That's what's killing our bees, and if we can control that, then we can increase the population of our bees, because we need them for our flowers, but we need them for about $15 billion worth of agriculture. Without the bees, we lose that food. All right. How about that? A lot of food. So how do you control the varroa mite? Have, have y'all gotten that far yet? There are a lot of things that we've been trying. There are different um, medications that we can give to the bees. We feed it in with the sugar syrup, or uh, the new one that people are using is oxalic acid. It's something that's naturally occurring in plants, and we vaporize it in the bottom of the hive. It goes up through the hive, and it kills varroa. We have to be sensitive to the brood pattern of the bees. So we don't want to put it in while brood is being reared. So not during spring, not during summer. So late fall, hit them with the oxalic and it'll kill the varroas. Mm. That's one. Uh, problem that we have is wax is oil-based. It absorbs a lot of stuff. And that's one of the things that we look at when we study bees is we'll pull wax out and we'll run it through a spectrum analyzer and see what is actually collected in the wax. And we can find years worth of pesticides, we can find years mm -hmm. worth of miticides, and we're finding a lot of strange brews that beekeepers put into their bees to try to control varroa. Interesting. And some of those strange brews, when they build up in the wax, become toxic mm -hmm. to the brood. And so there's a chance that the beekeepers themselves may be killing their own bees. Whoa. Bad things. Bad things. Oh, it's some good stuff. You and I talked about before static electricity. Isn't it crazy? It is crazy. Why don't you share that with our viewers? Uh, most of us think about honeybees going into a flower and digging down in the bottom of it to get pollen right. or digging down into the nectaries and sucking up nectar. And the, the honeybee's body is just covered with little tiny hairs. And when she gets in there, the common thinking is that she's knocking the pollen off and it's sticking to her hair. Mm -hmm. A study recently came out and what they found is that bees fly. They build up a static charge. And when they land on a flower, there's a static discharge. Just like shuffling your feet and tagging your friend and shocking them, <laughs> it's a discharge. And if you do it with tiny papers in a comb and build up the static charge on a comb, you can pick up paper. It happens with the bees. When they land the static discharge, any of the loose pollen that's on the flower jumps onto the bee. Crazy. She goes to the next flower, and when she lands, there's a reverse of that static charge of her body, and the pollen set on the bee goes to the flower, and the other go back to the bee. It is awesome, static <laughs> electricity. And another study came out, they're studying bumblebees, and the bumbles are actually able to determine whether or not the flower 
has been previously visited because okay. of the static difference. Huh. And so it's almost like a message saying, okay, I've already been touched, don't touch me again. And they go to the next flower. And so the flower and the bee are working with static electricity to get pollen from here to there. Is that just nuts? Who knew, Miss Lori? That's I, pretty cool. Isn't it pretty cool? <laughs> I, when he first told me that, I was like, you're crazy. You gotta let the folks know about this. <laughs> but it, it's real. Cool. And I, the biggest ones that I've been able to see is on the sunflowers. Okay. Because when a bee lands on the sunflower, she is just covered with this yellow pollen all over her body. And it's like, wow, that just happened in front of me. I got to get it on video now. Yeah, you got to do that. Wow, it's good stuff. So when are bees most active? Oh, as soon as the sun comes up. Okay. And that's one for people who are putting a pesticide on their plants to control the mites or whatever. You want to put it in late evening or okay. early morning. You want it to dry before the bees show up. So if it's daylight, the bees are out. If the temperature is above 50 degrees, the bees are out and they're flying. That's a lot of the controls that our, our farmers are working with for crop dusting or the sprays. And they've done a lot of good stuff in controlling the funneling of sprays into agriculture. So there's very little blow off. And that's a big thing in agriculture because they're getting hit for drift and everything else. Well, now the funneling of the spray, there's a, a vaporized spray on the inside mm -hmm and a, a wide angle spray on the outside to keep the pesticide where it wants to go instead of downwind. Yeah, drifting. So daylight hours. Daylight hours. So as soon as you hit dusk and you need to spray something, you need to do something with your flowers, do it then. Okay. That's, right why, that's why I asked that question. So I just can know that. Very good. All right, Mr. David. Good information as always. We Thank appreciate you. appreciate that. All right. This wilting that you see here, the squash leaf, may be an indicator of the squash vine borer. So we're going to look at the base of the plant, and I can actually see where it looks like a squash vine borer may have been there. So let's yank this out and see if we can find it. You can see here the entry points that the squash vine borer made. Uh, you can see the frass that it left behind. See if we can cut down here and find one. Maybe it got away from us. Well, you can definitely tell it's been there. Of course, it tunnels through the vascular tissue. So we didn't find the squash vine borer. Uh, it's probably already completed its life cycle and flying around somewhere and probably laying an egg. Uh, but what you want to do as far as control goes is use carbaryl. Spray the carbaryl or sprinkle it uh, around the base of the squash vine and that should give you the control that you're looking for. All right, this is our Q&A session. Mr. David, you jump in there and help us out, all right? I'll try. Here's our first viewer email with a picture. One of my older blueberry bushes, probably about six years old, is sick. The older part of the bush is brown. The berries were small and just riveled up. There does appear to be new growth coming out at the bottom. What should I do to save my bush? Thanks so much. I love my blueberry bushes. And this is Mr. Green right here in Bartlett. So Miss Lori, what do you think? First thing I would check is drainage. You know, oh, we've had yes. a really wet spring and um, my blueberries are doing great. Okay. But they're growing on a slope. And you know, so I'm suspecting it might be a drainage issue. And if they're, if they're not huge, he might dig them up and raise them a little bit. Um, but the, the fact there's new growth is, is a good sign. Yes. Um, and they also need to be thinned just pretty regularly mm -hmm. to keep the old canes out so that they're, the new ones will produce in a couple of years because otherwise it just kind of they have a, a end of life, if you will. Yes, yes. Okay. Along the same lines with me, you know, so drainage, you know, may be an issue. Second thing I thought about, we want to make sure that pH is acidic. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you might want to, you know, get your soil tested to make sure you have the right uh, pH for that situation. And the third thing is this, you do have new growth. I'll just prune it back. Because yeah, that pruning. might be some type of stem blight or something mm -hmm. like that. Maybe a fungus causing mm -hmm. that. So what I would do, I would just trim it back. Because again, you have the new growth. Yep, yep. So I think that'd be fine. Well, I'm, into dead, want... I'm into deadheading and pruning. Okay. So. And mulching with pine needles. Um, yes. Great underneath blueberries. Yes, yeah. yes. So there you have it, Mr. Green. I hope that answers your question. All right, here's our next viewer email. 
several of my boxwoods have leaves at the tips that are turning brown and dropping off. There are a pile of leaves under the shrubs and the tips are all bare as if something has eaten them clean. Hmm. What is causing the leaves on my boxwoods to fall off? And this is from Jeff in Germantown. Um, let me take a stab at this one. So I'm looking at the picture and I'm thinking possibly because of the stem lesions, this could be boxwood blight. So what I would like to do is, Mr. Jeff, hope you're watching. If you could bring a sample of that boxwood to the office, I will send it to our lab, the soil pest plant lab in Nashville, get Dr. Wendell to take a look at it, and let's see if this is possibly boxwood blight. Because boxwood blight is caused by fungus. You have leaf spot, you have stem lesions, you have defoliation, mm -hmm. and then you have death. So possibly could be treatable? boxwood blight. Is it treatable? How about pulling it out? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's going to be afraid you were going to say it's that. It's going to be pretty expensive, <laughs> wow. you know, to treat over mm -hmm. and over with a fungicide. Yeah. So my recommendation would be to pull it out because. I mean, those leaves, of course, are going to have the fungal spores. Mm -hmm. So if it's raining, you water, Mother Nature, whatever, it's going to be splashing around. Spread. And it's yeah. spread. So I would take them out. Yeah. With the funguses that we have with bees, that's, the, that's what we do. We eradicate. Take them out. All right. So, Mr. Jeff, yeah, if you could just bring a sample of that to the lab, you know, to my office, I'll make sure you get to the lab in Nashville because we want to check that out mm -hmm. just to make sure because... A lot of boxwoods here in <laughs> Shelby County. Yes, we do. So we don't want that to spread around the place. All right. So here's our next viewer email. A few weeks ago, you all said not to put green grass clippings in the garden for mulch. Wait for it to dry because fresh clippings will take the nitrogen out of the soil. I thought that the reason you mulch grass as you cut it was to put nitrogen in the soil from the clippings. Does using fresh grass clippings take nitrogen out of the soil? Which is correct, and this is from Miss Nancy. So here's the deal with that though, okay? Fresh grass clippings contains or are rich in nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. So as it starts to decay, it's adding those nutrients to the soil. Mm -hmm. What you don't wanna do is make a pile of the fresh grass clippings because a pile of the grass clippings inhibits water infiltration and air movement in the soil. Okay? It becomes slimy yeah. and it releases a nasty odor. So if you can use thin layers of the fresh grass clippings because again, that will add nutrients to the soil. You just don't want to pile it up. Okay? It leads to anaerobic conditions. Yeah, it's not mulch. You're not mulching. Yeah. With it. So that's the answer to your question. You can use the fresh grass clippings, just not in big piles. Mm -hmm. Because again, it does become slimy. It becomes anaerobic. Nasty. And really smelly. <laughs> and, it re and it smells bad. Very yeah, smelly. I, I nasty. smelled it. It's some real nasty stuff. So Ms. Nancy, I hope that answers your question. All right, here's our next viewer email. I have two raised beds full of plants such as verbena, zinnias, lantana, milkweed, salvia, and others in order to attract pollinators. The beds were planted over a month ago and are full of glorious flowers. My problem, there are no pollinators with the exception of a few bees and one or two small butterflies. Why don't I have any pollinators on my flowers? Have we killed them all off with our poisonous sprays? And this is from Ms. Rita, East Memphis. So, Ms. Rita, we actually have David Glover on the set today. So what do you think about that question? Well, one of the things that you need to look at is where are your pollinators? Mm. We have food deserts everywhere. And if, if the bees are not within two miles of your house, if they are not coming to your yard, it's because they're not there. You might want to come out to the Memphis Area Beekeeper Association <laughs> and get your own bees. Mm. We can help you become a beekeeper, and that way you have your own pollinators. That's the big issue. And if there is something blooming that is producing a nectar or a pollen that the bees want, they're going to go there first. Hmm. So look at the seasonality of what's pollinating, what's putting out nectar, and you might be getting the bees shortly. 
Okay. Anything to add to that, Ms. Gore? Well, for the host plants, too, for the caterpillars, you've got to plant food for the caterpillars if you want yeah. the butterflies. And folks will go out and mash every caterpillar they see because they <laughs> eat holes in the leaves right. of things. Yeah. You, but you, you can't really expect to have butterflies if you won't feed the caterpillars. All right. So, Ms. Lori, Ms. David, we're out of time. Thanks for being here today. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Remember, we love to hear from you. Send us an email or letter. The email address is familyplot at wkno.org. And the mailing address is Family Plot 7151 Cherry Farms Road, Cordova, Tennessee 38016. Or you can go online to familyplotgarden.com. That's all we have time for today. You can get more information on bees, houseplants, and other things we talked about on today's show by going to familyplotgarden.com. You can also ask your gardening questions and see it answered on TV. Thanks for watching. I'm Chris Cooper. Be sure to join us next week for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Be safe. Production funding for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South, is provided by Goodwinds Landscape and Garden Center, in Germantown since 1943, and continuing to offer its plants for successful gardening with seven greenhouses and three acres of plants, plus comprehensive landscape services. International Paper Foundation. The WKNO Production Fund. The WKNO Endowment Fund and by viewers like you. Thank you.